Hello everybody, welcome to EPG Patshala. I'm Monica Sakrani and uh, I'll be taking the fourth module of criminal law. Here we'll be looking at FIR and investigation of offenses for the course legal literacy. Uh, so uh, we'll begin with how the investigation of the investigation process goes on. The first step of investigation is uh, the registration of an FIR. Now, as we have done, uh, stated already in an earlier module, uh, in a cognizable offence, the police can investigate the case and uh, arrest the accused and file a charge sheet and try the case against the accused. And the first informant or the victim is only a witness in this case. So the first step of any investigation process is when the police gets information about a cognizable offence. Now this is known as first information report, first information of a cognizable offence. And once the police gets that, then the, it sets into motion the entire investigation process. So it's very important for us to understand, especially as social workers, what an FIR is and what is required of us if we go to the police station to register an FIR. Now. Uh, an FIR need not be in writing, it can also be oral, generally it is oral, but sometimes one may want to write it, uh, uh, write it down and give it to the police, but please don't write the sections. Uh, just write the facts of the case and give it to the police, uh, but it's important that uh, the fact should disclose that a cognizable offence has occurred. That is very important in a uh, FIR. So uh, if you go to the police station and you tell the police that this is what has happened, the police write it down, they have a format, even if you give it in writing, they will attach it to a format or they may record your statement again. But uh, they ha there's a form of an FIR. Nowadays in some uh, states, uh, for certain offenses, you can register what is known as an EFIR. So you go to the police website and uh, the form is there, you fill it up and then they automatically it gets registered. But suppose you go to the police station and you uh, stay, tell the police, then they f write down the gist of what you're saying. They may not write down everything that you're saying, but they will write down the important things. And uh, that after that, they will uh, start the investigation process. Now, what is important for us is that you need not be a victim in order to file an FIR. Now, suppose uh, my neighbor has gone on a vacation and I see that their house has been burgled. Now, do I call up my neighbor and tell the neighbor that you call up the police and tell the police that your house is burgled? Or I, as an eyewitness to the burgling or somebody who has knowledge of the offense that has taken place can also uh, tell the police. Now, in this case, okay, I can tell my neighbor and my neighbor will do the needful. What if I am traveling and I see an unknown person kill an unknown person? I am a witness, I witness to an offense. I can call up the police and say that one unknown person has killed another unknown person and then the police will start investigating the offense. So basically what I am trying to say is that it need not be the victim who will always be the first informant. Anyone who has information of the offense will trigger off the FIR and uh, start the process. Now uh, FIR can be, as in the previous example, that I, have, I don't know, in both the examples I don't know who has done it. Now, can I say that, oh, I don't know who has done it, so therefore I will not, or I come home and I find my house is burgled. I don't know who has come and done it. Now, in that case, can I say I cannot register an FIR because I don't know who has done it? I may have, uh, I can register, it can be an, against an unknown person. In the FIR, it will be written unknown person. The police will ask me for a description of the person who has done it if I've seen that person. For example, I'm traveling in the train, somebody comes and snatches my purse and runs away or snatches my mobile and runs away. I have seen that person, but I, uh, or in the case of that murder, I have seen the person. So I will have a description of the person, but even if I have not seen the person, I will just inform the police that this is what I know about the person or I don't know about the person. If I have seen the person, I should describe the person, uh, male, female, height, color. Police will generally ask you all those details, but uh, this is basically I have to give a description which will help the police trace the accused. So uh, this is something that uh, uh, one has to do in the FIR and the FIR will have all these particulars. If I know the accused, I should name the accused. Now suppose two people have done the, uh, I've seen two people, I can't, if I name only one person and I don't name the other and in the court I go and name the other, then it will lead to problems later on because it will amount to what is known as an omission. 
so these are things that I have to be careful about. I have to state everything. I can't state half the facts and not state half the facts because later on it will raise a doubt in the judge's mind about my own credibility as a witness and whether I'm really speaking the truth. Why did I not tell the whole truth? Why did I not disclose certain things? Why did I uh, hide certain things? Uh, why did I name somebody else who has not done it? So all these things one has to be very careful. Even if you're going with someone to the police station, you're taking a, a, you know, you're working in the field and you've taken somebody to the police station, you should prepare the person to uh, make the statement properly. So just don't take that person to the police station. Of course, the police spent a lot of time registering the FIR, but you should also prepare because especially sometimes a victim may come to the police station and be so traumatized that they may not remember all the facts and may not be able to tell everything. So then as a social worker, it is a uh, responsibility to see that the FIR is properly registered and we remind that person that, you know, you have to say this. So maybe make that person go through a run of the whole thing. Uh, do the exercise or write it down and take that person so that the person can read it and then uh, go and speak to the police about it. Now, uh, when the police write down the FIR, they take the signature of the first informant and in that FIR, it is at the last, so the police generally write down the FIR. So they'll fill up the FIR, the last statement which will be written in the FIR will be uh, the statement read over to me and found to be correct and therefore I'm signing the statement. Suppose the in, for example, in Maharashtra, the FIR will be registered in Marathi, in Tamil Nadu, it will be registered in Tamil, I don't know the language. So if the FIR is written in one language, then I have to ask the police to translate it in a language that I know and then sign it. And it will be written over there that the FIR, the statement was translated in this particular language which the informant understands and then the informant signed the statement. So these are precautions that as social workers, we are not lay people, we should know all these things and we should also protect the people we are working with to ensure that a proper FIR is registered. Now many times what happens is, uh, after the FIR is registered, a copy of the FIR has to be given to the witness. Now the police fi uh, don't just record one copy of the FIR, there are multiple copies. One copy is sent to the court. Now suppose you are uh, you're not for the first informant, you've not got the copy of the FIR because you're not the first informant, you're for the accused or you just want to know whether an FIR has been lodged. Now you're doing some work in the community and you feel that somebody, some enemies may have gone and uh, registered an FIR against you, you go to the police station, the police is not going to give you information then how do you get the copy of the FIR? Uh, now, uh, RTI could apply, uh, but also another easy way of getting information is that you can go to the particular magistrate's court. Now, each police station is attached to a particular magistrate's court. Now, that particular magistrate's court has to be sent a copy of the FIR as soon as it is filed. So if you, and there it is kept in, uh, in a file, all the FIRs year-wise are kept over there. So if you know, if you feel that it may be registered one week back, two weeks back, then you start looking at those FIRs to see whether an FIR has been registered against you. You can also make an application to the uh, magistrate for a certified copy of the application and they will give it to you, provided they feel that there's a reason why it should be given to you. Now the other thing about uh, investigation of an offense and uh, about FIR is, that uh, who investigates the case now the police investigate the case now there are so many police stations in each district everywhere all over the country now can i go to any police station and say that this is my case and you register and you investigate the case i cannot do that the police station which has the jurisdiction the territorial jurisdiction over the particular area so every police station has a limit of the police station territorially so that police station is the one which is supposed to, so if an offense has taken place in that area or part of the offense has taken place in that area, so suppose like some uh, child has been kidnapped and raped and murdered and the body is found somewhere else but the child was taken from another place. So in that case, uh, both the police station uh, which is uh, having jurisdiction over the area where the child was kidnapped as well as the jurisdiction of the police uh, uh, police station which where the child was found murdered both have the power to investigate the case 
Now suppose I am living in a particular area and uh, so they are the only ones who have the power to investigate. Now suppose I am living in an area, I don't know my, whether my area comes under this police station or under that police station, so I go to the wrong police station to register the case. And the police tell me that uh, we don't have the powers to investigate the case, we don't have the power to write the FIR, please go to this particular police station and register the FIR. Now can they do that? They cannot. Uh, the Supreme Court in various judgments has said that the police have to write an FIR once they get the information of a cognizable offence, irrespective of whether they have the power to investigate or not. So they have to record an FIR and then they send the particular FIR to the police station which has the jurisdiction to try the case and they have to inform me that we are writing the FIR but we are going to send it to X police station which will be actually investigating the case. Now this FIR is called a zero FIR. Why is it called a zero FIR? Every FIR when we go, the police start numbering an FIR from the beginning of every year. So every year, every police station will start numbering an FIR from one to whichever is the last FIR that they register in that particular year. Then next year, it will again begin with one. So it has to be uh, written down in a serial chronological order. Now suppose a, a police station registers an FIR and gives it the number that their uh, police station uh, uh, serially that particular number which is the next number in their police station. Then they are not actually investigating the case. Now once it goes to the other police station it will again be numbered according to their serial number. So therefore this police station will write zero in the number and send it to the other police station and that police station will register the case, will give it the serial number that is there as per their records. So this is known as zero FIR. So the police please remember has to register an FIR irrespective of whether they have the power to investigate the case or not and then they have to send it to the police station where the FIR will be registered. Now in many cases uh, we find that we go to the police station, the police will register an NC instead of an FIR. Now what are we supposed to do? First of all, uh, you have to realize whether it is an FIR or whether it is an NC. NC is generally noted down in a register which is like a book and they will write down in brief and they'll make you sign and they will uh, uh, maybe give you a copy of the extract, they'll give you a Xerox copy, NC copies also have to be given, whereas FIR, uh, they will, it is in a particular form. The other thing that you have to, suppose they give you an NC, nowadays some police stations also give you an NC in a, in a format which is very similar to an FIR. Now how do you know the difference? You read the section. FIR is under section 154 so and NC is not under section 154 it's under section 155 so please see what is the section that is written and then accordingly you decide whether it is an FIR or not because the difference between the two is that the, if the police register an NC they will not take any action under the case. Uh, so th uh, so your, you will, they will just register an NC, they will put sections which are non-cognizable and then they will tell you you go to court. So if suppose the police for whatever reason are not registering an NC what, or an FIR then what do you do? One is that you have the strategy of writing it down, you get a stamp from the police station and you send it to the superintendent of police. Under the CRPC the remedy is that you go to, you send a copy to the superintendent of police and the superintendent of police will direct that an NC should be registered an FIR should be registered the other is that you can go to the magistrate that particular magistrate who has jurisdiction over this particular police station and you write to the you make an application to the magistrate and ask for an order under section 156 3 of the CRPC saying that this is a cognizable offence and I want the police to register the case and direct investigation in the case. Now sometimes I may not go to the police, I may go directly to the magistrate and ask for a 156.3 order and I can get that done. If I feel that the people who are whom against whom I am filing a case are very powerful and they will influence the police in some way and therefore the case may not be registered. So then in that case I can go straight to the magistrate and I can get a 156.3 order. If it's a serious cognizable offence, the magistrate will give it. 
and then the police will have to investigate the case as in a normal FIR. So they will convert your complaint to the magistrate as a FIR. Another remedy is you can file a writ under section 226 of the constitution of India but generally the courts don't want you to because uh, as everybody knows we have done the constitution a writ lies only when there is no alternate remedy here you have an alternate remedy so therefore you should actually you uh, first exhaust your alternate remedies before you actually go and file a writ now there's an uh, FIR as far as possible uh, should have all the facts relating to the offense so important facts as I've already said should not be omitted as it will amount to contradictions and omissions contradiction is when I say one thing to the police and I say another thing to the court so I say X committed the offense to the police and I say Y committed to the offense of committed the offense in the court the court will just discard my evidence because I'm lying in one of the two statements and on a major point if I'm lying then the court will not want to believe me and uh, uh, give a conviction on the basis of that an omission is as i said if i saw x and y commit the offense and i only name x or y then that would amount to why have i done that now generally there may be many small things that one may have forgotten uh, small omissions or small exaggerations are generally not seen as fatal to the case so in uh, there is a uh, there is a legal maxim which says that if you are false in one then you are false in all but in India this does not apply the courts generally uh, you know look at your entire uh, statement and then they, if they feel that you are believable and you are corroborated on certain mat material particulars uh, with from uh, by other evidence then they will generally rely on your evidence but if there is a deep contradiction then that will go against you another important thing to remember is that when should i file an fir now generally when an offense takes place it should be filed immediately there should be no delay in the matter if there is a delay now suppose i've gone out of my out of station and i come back home and i open my cupboard and i find that my diamond necklace is gone then obviously i was on vacation after one month i discovered that the diamond necklace is gone then i go and register the fir so there is an explanation of why there is a delay because i just came to know uh, so then I have to be able to explain the delay otherwise if I know that my diamond necklace is gone and after one month I go and file it the court will believe will wonder why I have delayed the uh, filing of the registration of the case so in uh, and it may think that maybe I'm lying so these are things that one needs to take into account it has to be filed as soon as possible if there is any delay then uh, that delay has to be explained uh, it, but in one type of cases delay is not really fatal to the case and that is rape cases because unlike uh, my house or my uh, you know if I somebody has taken my purse and run away or taken my gold chain and run away I'll go straight to the police station but if I'm raped then I may not immediately go to the police station so one week 10 days delay sometimes even longer delays as long as they're explained are not fatal to the case the courts have said that one has to be sensitive in dealing with rape cases because no uh, you know generally a victim will go and talk to her family members and the family will then decide whether it should be done or not because there's still a lot of shame on a uh, attachment to the crime of rape so the victim feels that you know I, am i ready for that kind of uh, process am i ready to come out in the open and allow people to know that this has happened to me so therefore there is a there is delay in a case uh, gurmeet singh versus state of punjab uh, there was a the girl uh, she was raped she was a school girl who was raped uh, while going to write her exam and uh, her mother was not in town so she wrote her exams her exams got over after one week her mother came and then she told her mother till then she hadn't told anyone that she was raped only when her mother came back she told her mother that she had been raped and then the mother spoke to the father and other relatives and they decided to file a case now in that case the court said that it was very natural for a school girl to not go and immediately tell her father or others about it and to wait till her mother came back and the mother would also consult before filing an fir so it's a certain amount of delay in rape cases is held to be natural and it will not be fatal to the case now 
FIR is a very important document, but it is not evidence. The first informant has to come to court and give evidence and the FIR will be shown to that person and the person will have to identify a signature on the FIR and say that this is what I said to the police and that will be evidence. So if suppose a person has died, that FIR will not be uh, uh, used as a, as a document which will prove the case, except in very rare cases, which are normally if I'm died and before dying I have registered an FIR saying that somebody so and so has attacked me. So that is a dying declaration that can be used as a, as a statement so that need not be an FIR for it to be used any statement that I make with regards to my death will be used by the court will be taken into consideration by the court but generally an FIR will not be substitute for a person coming to court and giving evidence. Now. There is a case uh, which is very important for us to know which is Lalita Kumari versus state of UP. Now in this case the issue was that when you go to the police, the police uh, don't register an FIR and instead call the other side and they start having a compromise session or they start having what is known as a preliminary inquiry. So they don't immediately register an FIR and this is especially true in 498A cases that is cases of women who go and file cases against their husband. So the police refuse to register an FIR and they just sit on the complaint and they call the other side and they start uh, inquiring into the matter. So they don't say we are investigating into the matter, they say we are inquiring into the matter. Now this issue was there in, uh, in several judgments, this issue of inquiry kept coming up and though the Supreme Court had said in many cases that an FIR should be registered, in Lalita Kubari's case finally the issue was settled. So what the court said was that it is mandatory for the police to register an FIR if the complaint discloses the commission of a cognizable offence. So the police have no discretion, they have to register the FIR. If the information does not disclose the commission of a cognizable offence but indicates the necessity for an inquiry, then only then can an inquiry be conducted and the purpose of the inquiry is only to find out whether a cognizable offence occurred or did not occur. So that is all, they are not going to look at uh, whether the information discloses uh, a cognizable offence, they are not investigating into the truth or falsehood of that uh, complaint, they are only investigating, inquiring to find out whether the information really discloses the commission of a cognizable offence. Now suppose they hold that the, it does not disclose the commission of a cognizable offence, they will close the case, they will give reasons why they have come to this conclusion and give the copy to the to the uh, first informant or the complainant and they also have to send a copy to the magistrate and they have to inform the magistrate about why they are closing the case. The per person has the remedy of filing a case under 156.3 or going and filing a writ against this order. So these two remedies are always open to you if the police say that no cognizable offence is made out and therefore we are not registering an FIR. If an officer on disclosure of a cognizable offence refuses to register an FIR then action has to be taken against that person and this will be departmental action that will be taken against the person. It also amounts to dereliction of duty. Now we come to investigation of an offence. Now FIR has been registered, now what is the police supposed to do? They are supposed to go to the scene of offence or proceed to the spot. Now here they will take, uh, they will do what is known as a scene of offence panchnama. Suppose a theft has taken place in a particular place or a murder has taken place in a particular place. So the police will go there and they will do a kind of description of the entire scene of offence. Now what is a panchnama? A panchnama is a written document which is witnessed by two panchas. Who are these panchas? Panchas are witnesses who are not connected with the case at all. In legal parlance, they are called independent witnesses. So there are people like, suppose my house has been robbed, I will not be a pancha because I am the person whose house has been robbed. But my neighbours can be panchas because they, they are not affected by the crime. So a person who is not connected to the offence, who is not interested in any way in the offence, will be dispassionate and objective and truthful is the person who will be taken as a pancha. 
So Pancha will not be an eyewitness to the case. So Pancha, Panchnama will have a deep description of whatever is uh, uh, happening in that particular place, whatever is described. Now suppose in the scene of offence, a uh, knife is found, blood stains are found, then all these the police has to collect and they have to seize these documents. These, this seize, uh, seizure is done uh, uh, by way of, you know, that you protect the evidence. So if you're taken, like if there are fingerprints and you take fingerprints, but you seal all these documents so that tomorrow you can't take some other knife and say that this was recovered. So whatever is taken from a particular place under a panchnama, whatever is seized under a panchnama has to be sealed in front of the panchas and the signatures of the panchas have to be there. So suppose a knife is uh, seized, the knife will be wrapped in a plastic bag or plastic paper, it will be put in a, or in a paper bag and, and finally it will be, there will be a paper stuck on it which will have the case number, if there is an FIR number already registered, it will have the FIR number, it will have the uh, details of where it was seized from with the signatures of the panchas and the signature of the police officer who has taken charge of the article. So all these articles will be taken care of. If nothing is seized also the panchnama will be written then again it will be written that panchnama was uh, that we panchas saw this so it will be written like uh, we two panchas were called and then this was done in front of us. Now suppose uh, and then we witnessed this, this is what happened and now we are signing. And but these panchas have to come to court and prove the panchnama before the court. So they have to say, yes, this is what happened, this is my signature, this, uh, the, whatever is written in the panchnama is true and correct. So this is uh, the start of the investigation process and the police will start making inquiry about what are the facts and circumstances of the case, are there any eyewitnesses, are there any other witnesses, suppose like somebody's house has been robbed, you'll talk to the neighbours to find out, talk to the watchman. Uh, to find out what has happened. Suppose something has happened in a public place and you will go to the shops which are close by, you will talk to the people who are there to find out what they know about the case. And all these statements are written down by the police. So we will look at what is done in the uh, statements, how the statement has to be recorded in a little while. So this is one thing that the police do. So they record the statements of the witnesses. Then they do, if there is any other place that needs to be searched, now suppose a clue is there that somebody is, uh, you know, that uh, uh, suppose uh, that uh, you, how do you trace the uh, witness, suppose stolen property is there, you have to go somewhere else and search for the stolen property, so you do all that. Suppose I am a woman and I filed a 498 AK saying that my, the property has been, uh, you know, is there in the bank or it's there in, the, in my husband's house uh, or he has given it to his sister. So then they will go there and they will seize the, search the place and seize whatever property is there. So the police have the power to search and seize anything during the course of an investigation of a cognizable offence without a warrant. Now here we will pause for a minute and look at what is warrant. Warrant is an order of the court uh, saying that this should be done. So there are two types of orders of the court. One is what is called a summons and the other is what is called a warrant. A summons is when the court summons a witness to the court. So generally when the trial will go on, the court will summon a witness to the court. So these are summons which are passed and a warrant is that if you do not obey the order of the court, you will be arrested. So generally there are, uh, so warrant can be for search and seizure. But if the warrant is not allowed to be executed, the police have the power to arrest the person. Similarly, there can be other kinds of warrants what are called bailable and non-bailable warrants. Suppose a witness doesn't come to court repeatedly and the court wants the witness to come to court, then they can order either a bailable warrant that as soon as you are arrested, you will be released on bail or after your arrest, you will be brought to the court and only the court can grant you bail. That is a non-bailable warrant. But that uh, apart, uh, this is very important here for us to understand that if suppose the police come to your house and they want to search your house saying that we believe that some stolen property or some offence, some evidence of an offence is going to be, is there in your house and if they don't have a warrant, even then they have the power to enter the place. But what is important is that the police should, when they go to a particular place which belongs to somebody else, now what is my fear? That the police may come and implant certain evidence. It is not there, it's my word against the panchas word because panchas also 
even though they are supposed to be independent witnesses in many cases one finds that what is called stock panchas are taken into account so the same people are then as panchas in many multiple number of cases of the same police station and they have links with the police many of them are informers of the police some are working closely with the police for certain purposes so the police prefer to take these people because if I am asked to come as a pancha, suppose I am walking on the road and I am told that this offence has taken place, please come as a pancha. What is my attitude going to be? What is my answer going to be? I am going to say, no, no, I am very busy. I have to read somewhere. I can't come. So uh, even if I go there, then what is the guarantee that I am going to land up in the court when the evidence has to be given? So therefore, police prefer to take people whom they know, whom they can bring to the court to give evidence. So many of these panchas are also, uh, you know, not really independent. Uh, so suppose uh, one of the requirements as per the law is that when the police or a search party goes to some place uh, which belongs to someone else, then the police are supposed to give their own search and I will also give my search and then they will enter. So I have the right to say that tell the police, I may not, the police may be able to come in without a warrant, but I have a right to tell the police that I want to search you before I allow you to enter the house so that I know that you're not going to implant any evidence over here. So that is a right and it will be recorded in the Panchnama. A copy of the Panchnama, if any house is searched, anything is seized from a particular place, a copy of the Panchnama or the seizure report with the articles has to be, all the articles have to be mentioned in the Panchnama and a copy of that has to be given to the person from whom the articles have been seized. Uh, so that is the right of the person who, from whom, uh, in whose house a panch or in whose premises a panch uh, search Panchnama has taken place. Apart from that, suppose like, you know, in a rape case, in a murder case, in an injury case, a person will be sent for medical examination. So the, both the victim or the survivor as well as the accused will be sent for medical examination. If the body is, if a, there is a dead body, it has to be sent for autopsy or post-mortem. If suppose a gun is seized uh, or fingerprints are seized or uh, weapon is seized, they will be sent for handwriting, uh, you know, fingerprint analysis, forensic examination, uh, a ballistic report. So all these are things that the police are supposed to do as part of the investigation process. Now, uh, when the police are investi uh, take, recording the statement of the pol uh, witnesses, then uh, they have to ensure that if it's a girl, woman or a child below 15 years of age, then they should not be called to the police station. The witness will not get a copy of the statement. And this statement will be only used to contradict the witness as in the case of the FIR. Now, after the uh, investigation is complete, then the police, uh, uh, you know, so they arrest the accused, so they, they identify the accused, we have already run test identification parade, then uh, finally if the co uh, police have completed the investigation, they file a charge sheet. If after investigation of the case, they find that there is no evidence that they've been able to collect or they've not been able to find who the accused is because it's untraceable, or they find that it's a false case, then they have to close the case and give a report saying this. But if they've come to a conclusion that yes, a cognizable offense is made out, then they file a charge sheet. Now, charge sheet contains the police report, uh, which will have the names of the accused, the details of the witnesses, and what is the section, whether the accused is under arrest, whether the accused is released on bail, etc. It will also have the first information report, the statements of all the prosecution witnesses, any confession or statement uh, of the accused which is recorded by the magistrate uh, and any other documents such as chemical analysis report, post-mortem reports, panchnamas, etc. So all these will be part of the uh, charge sheet. If the police feel that they still need to further investigate the case or the magistrate feels that the charge sheet is incomplete, then they can still continue with the investigation after the filing of the charge sheet and they can file what is known as supplementary charge sheet. Now generally there is no time limit for filing of the charge sheet, though in offences which are punishable with uh, 10 years or less, uh, charge sheet should be filed within 60 days and in other cases within 90 days. But this 90 days of the arrest of the accused and 60 days of the arrest of the accused, otherwise as we have done in the earlier bail uh, uh, module, the accused has the right to be released on bail. 
so otherwise even if the accused is released on bail i can still file the charge sheet later on so there is no uh, time limit for the uh, uh, for the police to file a charge sheet but suppose the police hasn't filed a charge sheet for 5 years and i am the accused in the case does that mean that i am kept hanging no i can go to the high court and i ask i can ask for quashing of the fir on grounds that the police may not have found any evidence against me and therefore they've not filed a charge sheet so i have that remedy uh thank you very much we have uh, what we have looked at in this module is the uh, how the police investigate the case what is required in an fir and what is the steps in the investigation till the filing of the charge sheet thank you very much